Good morning. Welcome to the foot of the cross. Uh, I can say with a smile for a change, we see something we ain't seen in a couple of days or seems like months is the sunshine. <laughs> it's so good to see the sun shining this morning, but it's even better to see your smiling faces here. And the ones on YouTube and Facebook, we want to thank you for listening to us. Uh, our subject today is going to be uh, continuous of last week, uh, managing our mind. And uh, out of all the sermons I've ever preached or taught in all my years, this has been when I've gotten the most response out of people calling me and saying how it touched them and how it stood up. This young man was here last week, went home and got some books and started digging into some things he was struggling with. And that was just such a blessing. And I got to talk to this young man for about an hour on the telephone and he was so excited about what the message was that he said he's going to start subscribing and start watching us. He would be here, but they're an hour and a half away dry, so we, we can't expect him to come every Sunday, but he's here in spirit, and that's what's good. But what I want to do first is I want to go to the Lord in prayer. There's a lot of sickness going around. I've been battling it, and i tell you what, what Jesus did on that cross cures all things. It heals all things, and it brings everything under submission of his foot, and that's the foot of the cross. So let's go to him in prayer, and let's just remember everybody that's sick that's not able to be here, and we're just going to claim their healing in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for your love and mercy. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for this awesome day to be able to come in your house, Lord. Lord. We thank you for each and every one that's here, Lord, the ones that are listening, Lord, and the ones that couldn't come, Lord. Lord, I just pray, Lord, right now there's this flu epidemic that's going around in the news. You can't turn the news off with them talking about the uh, coronavirus and the, all these different strains of viruses and how they need these flu shots. Lord, we don't need no flu shot. We just need a shot of you, Lord. We need a shot of that blood that you shed on that cross, Lord, that precious blood that you shed that you did willingly, Lord, that by your stripes we were healed. And all we have to do is tap into that, Lord, and receive what you've already done, Lord. And, Lord, this morning I just claim healing on each and every one that's able to hear this voice. And, Lord, that they have the mindset, Lord, to receive what you did on that cross, Lord. Lord, let's pray, Lord, as I bring this message, Lord, that we we have an open heart, Lord, but most of all, we have an open mind, Lord, that we work into our mind, Lord, and learn that we can do all things in Christ Jesus that strengthens us. Lord, that you said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, Lord. And that's what our subject is today, Lord. Let us think your thoughts and have your mind, Lord, and have the mind of Christ. And Lord, as we go into this service, Lord, I just dedicate this time, Lord. We know that your presence is here because your people are here, Lord. And you said you dwell in the midst of the people, Lord. Wherever there, there's one more than one gathered in your name, Lord, that you pull up a chair and sit down right in the midst of us, Lord. And you join us and you 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 teach us and you conversate with us, Lord. And you 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 embrace us, Lord, and you love on us like as we love, love on you. So as we go forward, Lord, we just give you this time and we say we love you with all our hearts, mind, body, and soul. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I get started, I was surprised with a gift from a visitor I've never even met before to the day. And look, I just want everybody to see this. If you can see this, this is something beautiful. And this is what we call, we call this church the foot of the cross. Jesus gave me that. He said in all the videos, he'd never seen a cross. And I just want to thank him for what he did, what beautiful work. And I want you to know this is going to be precious to this church because it was done by the heart. You can't separate the cross and the heart. You can fill in the blanks wherever the word cross is. You can put heart, love, joy, and peace, and it always makes sense. So I want to thank you for that. Now, as we go in our services, we always have a testimony. And this first lady, this, this testimony that we have, I want you to pay attention to. It might not be some great miraculous thing God did, but God worked on her mind. And he dealt with her in her way, and she wrote a song. And I think of you as the name of the song. So as you watch this video, listen to her song and where she is, and maybe it can bring healing and understanding to where we are. So I told you that our, that our subject is managing memory uh, and imagination, but I want to go into this part here. We'll move into our scripture. Back up. I'm going to hear It all starts when, started, I should say, when I was, um, when I was 13, I was a cheerleader, and I'd like always been a chunky girl, and, and I was kind of okay with myself, and one night I was cheerleading, and this teenage boy walked by, and I still remember his name, I remember what he was wearing, and he leaned to, 
over to his friend to where I could see and hear him and he said, that girl's too fat to be cheerleader. It did something to me and and I didn't even realize how powerful those words spoken into me were. You know, as a teenager and, and a young adult, all I ever heard was, you know, you'd be a knockout if you just lose 50 pounds or you'd be beautiful if you just lose weight. You'd get a record deal if you were thinner. And so I just equated my beauty with my size. Then I met my husband who was this amazing, geeky nerd who was just smarter than I could possibly imagine. He used to work for Apple and he disassembles Macs for fun and he's just super nerdy. And, um, but he told me I was pretty. I mean, I meant it. And I was just like, not, I'm not saying, you know, go marry the first guy who tells you you're pretty, but, um, <laughs> I that when I was uh, but he just, he meant it. And I, and I remember when I knew that I wanted to marry him, he looked at me and he said, I, I know that I know that I'm supposed to marry you and take care of you the rest of your life, no matter where God calls you to. And last year he said, you know what, um, I, let's have a baby. And I just looked at myself and I thought, I'm sick all the time. I'm touring with Sayla. I used to get migraines. I was getting ill on flights and trying to just push through. And, and I was like, you know what, God, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. I am so done. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to weigh. I don't know what I'm supposed to look like when I'm miserable and I just need you to fix me. And so I just laid it at his feet and I was like, I don't know how I'm supposed to do this because I've done Weight Watchers like 12 times. I've done, you know, hip hop abs. I remember sweating to the oldies with Richard Simmons when I was like 13. And I'm like, nothing works long term, Lord. But it was because I had never asked him to help me. And I always tried to get skinny for guys or for cheerleading or for a record deal. And it was like, you know what, Lord, I want to get healthy for me so that I can have a healthy child and really be able to minister in some freedom here not be walking around held up in chains that nobody can see. And God is so cool because I have a friend who I haven't spoken to in like five years and she's a nutritionist and a personal trainer and a diet coach and she has this program and she said the Holy Spirit put her on my heart like call Amy, call Amy and she was like I'm not going to call up some girl I haven't talked to in five years like you want to go on a diet? She'll hate my guts. <laughs> She was like, no, Lord. And like every day in her prayer time, she said my name would just pop in her spirit. She was like, I do not know what to do. And so she found me and she said, I want to coach you. And since last May, I've actually lost 80 pounds with her. <laughs> but it's just been amazing because all of the other stuff I've lost, on top of the weight, like the anger and the bitterness that I didn't know I carry around inside my heart and the hurt, like I can let go of that boy. For 20 years, I carried his face in my heart. And, and wept when I looked in the mirror because some boy called me fat. Um, so when I sing the song, I just, I share this. I just tell people, like, this is, you know, I'm still, do the math, I weighed 282 and I lost 80, so I'm still over 200 and I still got a path to go. I still got some weight to lose, but, and so I just, you know, encourage people when, when I sing this to, to stop looking at the circumstances that, that have just hurt them and stop looking at the people and just look to God and just lay it in his feet because he can do so much more with it than we possibly ever could. Thank you. 
tell us is we, we, we're being beat up by this world all day long. You cannot turn the news or the TV on to something negative 24-7. And that gets embedded into our brain, in our mind. And we start to go into our imagination. And that's what we're going to go to in a minute. And it just starts to eat at us and eat at us. But God says there's nothing too small. There's nothing so insignificant that he does not want to intervene and move in your behalf. Now, the thing of it is, I told you a long time ago, the devil can't stop you. All he can do is distract you. So what he tries to do is get you people in your ear to give you your fat, your, 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 your dumb, your, you'll never make nothing in your life. Because you'll start, to, you'll receive that. For some reason, we'll receive negative things faster than we would good things. And the Bible says that we need to take and understand that when we think we're weak, he says we're strong. And so we have to understand that. And we're going to go a little bit more into that. But this next song was from Nora, and she's not here. But she suggested this song to be talking about memory and imagination. So our next song was from Nora. Will I 
you imagine Jesus sitting right there in the midst of you. If that don't put a smile on your face, I don't know what will. I see, here's the thing about it. As much as you imagine him, as much as he's with you. As much as you can imagine, his depth comes closer and closer to you. That's his desire. He created you just so you would desire him to be in your midst. Is that not awesome? He calls us his peculiar treasures. The world says we're nothing, but he says we're his treasures, that we're precious. We're the apple of his eye. We're the gleam that makes him smile. So just, just when, you have, when you're having a bad day, just stop where you're at, close your eyes, and just imagine that he's right there with you. And he says he'll never leave you, and he'll never forsake you. Whatever your heart's desire, you have the capability of happening. The only way you get it is you imagine it. And he says, faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith is the substance things not seen and brought into the presence. The only things that keeps it from coming into your presence is you, not the devil. The devil has no control of you. But when you gave your heart to the Lord, he had to release it. And he has no power no more. The only authority he has is what you give him. I just wanted you to do that. I, I told you our scripture would go into our main scripture. Jesus said to them, you shall love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, last week I broke it down and I told you, soul is your intellect and your personality. It's another word for your mind. And so I broke it and rewrote it that Jesus said unto them, you shall love your Lord, your God, with your heart and with your mind and with your mind. 
And I asked you, why would he repeat himself? Because I told you, your mind basically does two things. Either memory, has a memory, or has imagination. Anything you do out of your mind will either work out of your memory, your past, or your imagination. It says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, I, I left the word out heart last week on purpose because I was dealing solely with the mind to get you to understand what we we're talking about. But I went and broke down this word. It says, as a man thinketh in his heart. So he didn't say, as a man thinketh in his head. He said, as he thinketh in his heart. So I, I told you my favorite dictionary is my favorite book. So I like to break down words what they mean. So I went and looked it up, and the, when the word heart here is in scripture, in Hebrew, it means sub. And this is where we get our word subconscious. Now let's reread read the scripture that way. So as a man thinketh in his subconscious, so is he. And of all the scriptures, all the words, all the, the, the stories, and everything from, from uh, Genesis to Revelation, Never does it say one thing that defines what a man is, except what they think in their heart. So what they think in their subconscious is who they are, that who identifies them. If my subconscious, I think I'm a great man and I can do all things and God can strengthen me to do things, I walk in a different attitude. But if I walk up in my memory where I've been beat up and told I'll never amount to nothing, I walk around defeated with my head down. You ever seen some people when they come up, you all might go, you want to pull away from them because they bring all this negativity in because they live into their memory of all the bad things that's happening to them. And then there's some people that draw you to them because when you come into their presence, they always got a smile on their face. They always got a joke. They always got something to make you to pick you up and make you feel. And you, you just are drawn to these people. And that's what God says. If we want to win the loss, that's the way we got to live our life. But we walk around in the world and living in a memory instead of our imagination, and we're walking around defeated because this world will defeat you. It says, the Bible says, never says you'll never go through trials and tribulations. It does say he'll be, he has overcome all things, and if you abide in him, and he abides in you, that you'll overcome any situation you're in. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to get in the fire, but when he got in the fire, he got in there with them. So that should, is a testimony. I told you last week, whatever you're struggling with, and whatever has been your enemy might be your weapon of choice to be able to defeat and help somebody else in what they're struggling. So let's go into it. I, I, I found this picture and it just really illuminated with me. God just pulled it out. And it shows that the conscious mind and the subconscious. See how much bigger the subconscious reflects and how much bigger it is? That's, that represents our memory and our, and our conscious mind, which means the good thing about a conscious mind, it, it don't last long. It, a, a conscious mind would be, you know, what did I eat two weeks ago? Uh, what, what shirt did I wear uh, on a Tuesday, December 26, 1973? I don't know unless you're just some kind of extraordinary person that's got a memory like a hawk. Now, I remember stupid stuff like that, but that's just the way I'm wired. But you go to the, your, your conscious and the imagination. See how important they need to work on their imagination? And I'm going to show you, I'm going to break it down. We spend all our time in our memory of all our failures, all our, our, our uh, inefficiencies, the things that, that slap us in the face, the people, like the, the, uh, like the testimony before this. If you do this, you could have been this. If you have done this, you're, you're never gonna be able to please this world. But here's the thing about it. You can please the creator by showing that you love him and trust him and you allow him to work in your life. So this is what we need to camp out in, in our imagination. This is where we need to spend our time working on it. And where does that come by? By, by putting in things that, see, see, a lot of people get mistake uh, imagination with memory because they live in their memory so much, that's all they can think of. So they think that's their imagination because they're thinking of all the bad things and all it is is they're staying there. I'm old school, so I'm not gonna use a computer, I'm gonna use a file cabinet. If you come up to me and say, you you you, uh, you missed that one big time. Guess what I did? I go straight to the file cabinet and I pull out every file that I ever failed in. And I start reading it and I start studying it and I start dwelling in everything I had done wrong. Now if I was a computer, a young man that was computer savvy, I'd get on the computer and I start Googling it. I ain't that good yet. I'm learning though. But I, they get on there and they study everything they can about that subject. So guess what? If you think you're negative and you start studying negative, you can prove you're negative. 
There's enough evidence in this world you can prove you're negative. But if you get there and start claiming that you can do all things in Christ Jesus and you start Googling that, you can find out there's a lot of things you can do you didn't think you can do. So that's what we have to live in. It's here, so our battle in our mind is learning how to balance our mind and our subconscious. See, the devil, the, the, uh, Joyce Myers wrote a book, The Battlefield Begins in the Mind. You see, because the devil, he knows if I can plant just a seed of doubt in your mind, you'll water it. Because Jesus said, and he told his disciples, and basically in layman terms, if you don't understand this one thing about sowing the seeds, you might as well forget about the other things. And so the devil understands that that principle works even for bad. That if I plant a poison ivy seed, guess what I get? I get poison ivy, which could cause me to break out. It caused me to have the hives and everything else and the itch and bad thing. Or I can go plant a tomato seed and I'm going to have a tomato sandwich after all. So it's all in seeds that we do. And we, and we water the seeds and we've got to learn what seeds to water and what seeds to pluck out. If you want to stop something started, that stop it at the root. So as we go on, I broke it down here again. A conscious mind, most of the time, this is scientific. This is not dull. I went and looked up what science says. Science says we use about 10% of our conscious mind. And we use about 90% of our imagination. People say it's not what defines you is not what you do, but how you handle it. Because the way you handle it is the way you imagine it. You know, and what you, you, you think you can do with it. But in our conscious mind, some of the description was a critical thinking, logical thinking, short-term uh, memory, willpower. Willpower, I got strong willpower. I had to fight that one constantly. I told you last week, what I'm teaching you right now, I'm battling. And I'm trying to apply this to my life because I want to prove it right. Because I've been struggling, because I'm going to tell you what, if you put something in front of me, I'll move it physically. I don't care if I pass out till I can't push no more, I'm going to push it out of my way. If I can get my hands and my legs on it, I'm going to get it out of my way. But you put something to me, I'm a very tender teddy bear. That if you say something that, that hurt me, it will eat at me and it will destroy me and I, I, it will just mess my day up. I'll, I'll be depressed. I'll go to, I'll go to my wife. Do I really act like that? Is that really who I am? And I start to water it because that doubt, I'm giving it room to grow. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? So we go up here in our behaviors, our habits, our beliefs. So our beliefs comes out of our memory. All memory is not bad. Memory empowers your imagination. See, when, when uh, God said, he gave everybody a measure of faith. So everybody has exactly the same seed that was sowed to them. When you accepted Jesus in your heart, he gave you that same measure of faith. Now the difference is, do you store it in a file cabinet, keep it away in your conscious mind, or do you bring it into your imagination and start watering it and seeing what that faith can do? That makes sense. We, we want to file it away and use it on a bad day instead of using it every day. See, how many knows when, when you go into exercise, that first time you exercise, you're not going to do what you can do later down the road. You're going to start off with something very light. And when you go home, you're going to be very sore. And you're going to know everything you did because you're not used to doing it. When you start exercising this here and start going in your imagination, you're going to feel some pains. You're going to feel some soreness. You're going to see some people looking at you saying, these people are crazy. See, here's the thing. I told you it has to be a balance. I can't live in imagination and think everything's hunky do and I can fly and I can do all this thing. I have to have memory. God told uh, Joshua and them that when their victories, go get some stones. Go stack them up and make a, a memorial. So anytime you get depressed and you feel defeated, you go back to them stones. And it will remind you of your victorious time. See, memory is used should be used to bring back the, the victories, the, the overcoming, the, the conquerors that we've done in our life. But we, we dwell so much in the negativity, that's the only thing we bring up in our memory. How we build our memory up and turn our memories into good things, we start living in our imagination. I told you another word when Noah asked me last week, it was confirmation. My next slide was imagination could be another word for faith. That I, I see things... See, faith, the best way, uh, an old country boy, I'm just an old country boy, I like to break it down simple. If I had to explain to you what faith is, faith is reaching into the unseen world, the invisible things, the things all you hope for, dream for, all the 
apple pies and shovel eggs, which I look forward to. But shovel eggs. But so you go in here and you pull it into the natural realm and you let it come to fruition. But if you never reach in there, you're never going to be able to bring it out. You see what I'm saying? And it takes imagination to be able to do that. Because you ain't going to know what to think about. I'm just going to go try to pull something that don't even exist into fruition. Now, how do I do that? I go into my memory. Memory is logical thinking. That means I told you that the devil can reign in anything you don't know. So you need knowledge. So if I'm struggling with something, it's my duty to go get knowledge and to put it into my memory. So when I go to that file cabinet and I go have a trouble and I try to pull up what I'm going through, I'm pulling up a memory of great things. Okay, the Bible says that I'm a conqueror, that my father owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I can do all things in Christ Jesus that strengthened me, that I'm the head, not the tail, that when I'm weak, he's strong. That he'll never leave me, he'll never forsake me. Wherever I go, he goes. That he'll stand in the, in the midst of all my praises. So anytime I'm in doubt, all I got to do is start praising. How many of you, when you get down and somebody is slapping you in the face, and I say slapping, but I mean spiritually, slapping you in the face, stop to start praising God. There ain't nothing to praise God about. But he says, if you'll stop, I'll be in the presence of you. And I, I'm not, and at, at, at work, I'm trying to be careful in how I say this, but at work I struggle because in my life, I've always had to prove I could do something. And I will kill myself trying to prove I can do something to my own demise. Instead of being like Jesus, when Jesus was confronted, they said, who do you say I am? He asked, who do you say I am? He never tried to prove who he was because he knew who he was. You know what I'm saying? We have to learn to know that I am who I am. And that God dwells within me. That I might not be perfect in your eyes, but he says I'm perfect in his eyes. Because I have the blood, his blood that flows inside of me. That are his child, his treasure, his peculiar treasure. So let's let's go on to the next one. So I told you there's where our memory is, about 10% of our scientific proof, 10% of our mind works off our memory, and 90% of our imagination. See, I'm an old fighter. And I picked this picture up because they just I want to find a, a picture of a fighter because if I have I struggle with somebody coming against me. The first thing I want to do is bow my chest up and say, you ain't going to do that to me. I want to take it in the, into the, the natural realm. I want to say, by God, I'm stronger than you. I'm bigger than you. You're not going to talk to me like that. So I'm trying to attack the situation. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to attack my mind. My next screen I come up with, I show where a man's fighting his memories and his struggles. And this is where we need to learn how to attack the mindset. So instead of when that person comes up and confronts me and, and tries to put me down, the first thing I got to do is I got to go back in my mind and say, you know what? This guy, he, he is ignorant. Ignorance is not a bad word. It means he's unlearned. And you call him stupid. There ain't nothing to do about stupid. Stupid is stupid. But ignorance means you're unlearned. <laughs> and there's some stupid people in the world. God bless them. He loves them too. <laughs> But you can't do nothing about it, but ignorance, you can actually say, okay, this is my opportunity to teach this person who I really am. And by me being physical and coming back at an, at an, as, as an attitude, I'm going to say, you know what? Maybe she don't understand where I'm coming from. Let me in, let you enter into my mind and let me show you how I think. Now, here's the thing about it. I'm not going to tell you they're going to accept you every time, but God's going to bless your faithfulness of what you did. And here's what you're going to do. You'll learn. I'm going to back up. I asked you earlier to close your eyes and imagine Jesus beside you. How many of you seen Jesus beside you? Every one of you did. Because you took time to stop and do that. At that moment, you have to do that same thing. You have to stop and go in and apply your imagination, which is faith. And say, okay, God, this you know. You said you wouldn't put nothing on me I couldn't stand. And this is hurting me. So I need your advice. I'm going to tell you just like the latest song. I'm thinking of you. I need you to show me how I can use this moment to love this person. But Jesus said, he gave us two commandments. He said, love your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. The second one is liking 
which means exactly the same amount, the same type of authority, same time of strip, and love your neighbor. Not just your neighbor, but your enemy. So God loves us. Now, we're being obedient. God takes and, and blesses the obedience of ours. So when we sit there and say, okay, God, I don't understand this. I need your help to help me show love to this person here. I'm keeping the commandments. So God has to work in my behalf. He can't not do it. He has to. That's his word. He says, if you're bad by my laws, I'll dwell within you. So if he dwells within you, that means you're going to be blessed and have a peaceful life. That's not going it takes time to get to there. I'm not there. I still like to go back to that. Because that's what I'm used to. That's what I practice most of my life. So guess what I do? When I, and habit creates life, um, habits create lifestyle. And so the, whatever your habit is, that's gonna be what your lifestyle develops, whether it's good or bad. If I if I'm if I'm a drug addict. I'm going to have a drug addict lifestyle. I'm going to be into that world, and, and that's where I'm going to dwell in. But if I try to stay out of it, whatever I stay in, that's where I'm going to live. If I'm a football fan, I'm going to surround myself around football stuff. And I'm going to get knowledge on how to learn how to play. So this is where I have a tendency that my mind wants to go to every time I get a struggle. And God's showing me that's not where he made me. That's what not he's called me to do. Now, I think I'm good at that. God says, that's not what I'm good at. God says, this is where I got to go. I got to go into my mindset. And I got to understand that, you know what? Maybe this is a, I'm here for a reason. Maybe this confirmation, it wasn't to David come to Goliath, he become who he was. So sometimes whatever your enemy is might be what projects you into what you're called to be. It's said, how you handle it, whether you're going to be successful or not. Does that make sense? Then you could have ran and said, no, I ain't messing with that giant. Y'all scared of him, I'm scared of him, he could have went home. But no, he went to his memory. He pulled out the fire cabinet uh, uh, and he pulled it up and said, you know what? I slew a bear. I slew a tiger. He's just a Philistine. I'll do it to him. And in his imagination, he seen Goliath's head in his hand. And guess what happened? He took the word and what God had told him, and by his faith and his imagination, he slew the giant. Now, let me tell you something. That's not an easy thing to do. But when you start doing things like that, people will start seeing your life. And the testimony you want to have for your life is going to be what wins people to the loss. I don't think you go through anything just because you're going through it. I think you're going through it to learn something. And if you keep going through it, maybe we're not learning it. I think I'm not learning this because I keep going through it over and over and over. So I have come to a conclusion that I'm going to learn how to handle this. And so I'm going to change my mindset. And it's not easy. This is a, that's my wife, this is a hard head. I got a puppy that might battle with me close, but this is a hard head. If I get my mindset on something, I'll run through a brick wall. When I play football, when I strap my helmet on, I will pull it through. And I was the smallest guy on the field, but you can never tell me that. I thought I was a giant. And I'm saying that in, in this thing, we have to learn to change our mindset. And what you think in your heart is who you are. Now, I want you to look at this. This is something that we're dealing with in this country. I want you to pay, I come across this, and there's a reason I go to it, and I'll go into it when it's over with. That was a lie. So I told you I'm hard in it. I won't let it whoop me. This is dealing with our country. This is one of the things that we're hearing people battle right now. And I just thought this was an awesome thing to bring to the side. There was a lawyer once, his name was Francis Scott Key. He penned a song that I'm sure you're aware of. You've seen it, it's in most hymnals throughout our churches. It's called the National Anthem. It is 
our song as an American. We go, however, to... His name was Francis Scott Key. He penned a song that I'm sure you're aware of. You've seen it. It's in most hymnals throughout our churches. It's called the National Anthem. It is our song as an American. We go, however, to a ball game. We stand in our church services and we sing the words of that song. And they float over our minds and our lips and we don't even realize what we're singing. Most of us have memorized it as a child, but we've never really thought about what it means. Let me tell you a story. Francis Scott Key was a lawyer in Baltimore. The colonies were engaged in vicious conflict with the mother country, Britain. Because of this conflict and the protractedness of it, they had accumulated prisoners on both sides. The American colonies had prisoners and the British had prisoners. And the American government initiated a move. They went to the British and they said, let us negotiate for the release of these prisoners. They said, we want to send a man out to discuss this with you. They were holding the American prisoners in boats about a thousand yards offshore. And they said, we want to send a man by the name of Francis Scott Key. He will come out and negotiate to see if we can make a mutual exchange. On the appointed day in a rowboat, he went out to this boat and he negotiated with the British officials. And they reached a conclusion that men could be exchanged on a one-for-one -one basis. Francis Scott Key, jubilant with the fact that he'd been successful, went down below in the boats, and what he found was a cargo hold full of humanity, men. And he said, man, I've got news for you tonight. You're free. He said, tonight I have negotiated successfully your return to the colonies. He said, you'll be taken out of this boat, out of this filth, out of your chains. As he went back up on board to arrange for their passage to the shore, the admiral came and he said, we have a slight problem. He said, we will still honor our commitment to release these men, but it will be merely academic after tonight. It won't matter. And Francis Scott Key said, what do you mean? He said, well, Mr. Key, he said, tonight we have laid an ultimatum upon the colonies. Your people will either capitulate and lay down the colors of that flag that you think so much of, or you see that fort right over there, Fort Henry? He said, we're going to remove it from the face of the earth. He said, how are you going to do that? He said, if you will, scan the horizon of the sea. And as he looked, he could see hundreds of little dots. And he said, that's the entire British war fleet. He said, all of the gunpowder, all of the armament is being called upon to demolish that fort. It will be here within striking distance in a matter of about two and a half hours. He said, the war is over. These men would be free anyway. He said, you can't show that for it. He said, that's, that's a large fort. He said, it's full of women and children. He says, it's predominantly not a military fort. They said, don't worry about it. They said, we've left them a way out. He said, what's that? He said, do you see that flag way up on the rampart? He said, we have told them that if they will lower that flag, the shouting will stop immediately. And we'll know that they've surrendered, and you'll now be under British rule. Francis Scott Key went down below and told the men what was about to happen. And they said, how many ships? He said, hundreds. The ships got closer, Francis Scott, he went back up on top and he said, Men, I'll shout down to you what's going on as we watch. As twilight began to fall, and as the haze hung over the ocean as it does at sunset, suddenly the British war fleet unleashed. <clears throat> he says, The sound was deafening. There were so many guns that there were no reliefs. He said it was absolutely impossible to talk or hear. He said suddenly the sky, although dark, was suddenly lit. And he says from down below, all he could hear the men, the prisoners, saying was, tell us where the flag is. What have they done with the flag? Is the flag still flying over the rampart? Tell us. One hour, two hours. 
two hours, three hours into the shelling. Every time the bomb would explode and it would be close to the flag, they could see the flag in the illuminated red glare of that bomb. And Francis Scott Key would report down to the men below, it's still up. It's not down. The Admiral came and he said, your people are insane. He said, what's the matter with them? He said, don't they understand this is an impossible situation? Francis Scott Key said, he remembered what George Washington had said. He said, the thing that sets the American Christian apart from all other people in the world is he will die on his feet before he'll live on his knees. The Admiral said, we have now instructed all of the guns to focus on the rampart to take that flag down. He said, we don't understand something. Our reconnaissance tells us that that flag has been hit directly again and again and again, and yet it's still flying. We don't understand that. But he said, now we're about to bring every gun for the next three hours to bear on that point. Francis Scott Key said the barrage was unmerciful. All that he could hear was the men down below praying. A prayer. God keep that flag flying. Lord, we last saw it. Sunrise came. He said there was a heavy mist hanging over the land, but the rampart was tall enough. There stood the flag, completely nondescript, in shreds. The flagpole itself was at a crazy angle, but the flag was still at the top. Francis Scott Key went aboard and immediately went into Fort Henry to see what had happened. What he found that happened was that that flagpole and that flag had suffered repetitious direct hits. And when hit had fallen, but men, fathers, who knew what it meant for that flag to be on the ground, although knowing that all of the British guns were trained on it, walked over and held it up humanly until they died. Their bodies were removed and others took their place. Francis Scott Key said what held that flagpole in place at that unusual angle were patriots' bodies. He penned the song. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming. Or the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that the flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet lie and wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. The debt was demanded. The price, it was paid. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proud
we take that flag for granted. There's a lot of bodies that were given up, their lives given up, that we can have the freedom to be able to operate in our imagination and to have our faith. This country was built on our faith. It was because of the freedom of religion, which we are able to be able to do what we do this morning and do if the world wants to take that away from us. There's people who want to protest that, burn it, tear it up, and try to destroy it. Now, I told you the physical part is we want to fight back. The best way we can fight back is to fight back in our mindset. I'm going to love you anyhow, but I'm going to show you where you're wrong. I'm going to show you with love. You can't correct out of anger. You have to correct out of love because love accomplishes all things. So in this message, is, I, I wanted to wrap it up and let you know that you are what you think you are. If you think you're an overcomer, guess what you are? You are a great overcomer. You're not just an overcomer. You're more than an overcomer. Peace is what our, our whole hope for. Jesus said unto that storm when he stepped up, he said, peace, be still. Peace hadn't done nothing. So why did he call peace out? He called peace out because whatever he spoke to, he gave authority. And he said, peace, you have authority now. We have that same authority. Speak whatever we want. If we want peace, we speak peace. If we want war, speak war. And guess what you'll have? Bible says rejoice in all things, all things, even the good, the bad, the indifferent, whatever, always rejoice. I told you dictionary is my favorite word, so I broke the word down. Read means to do it again. Joyce means to praise. Rejoice means you're going to have to do it over and over. That means there's going to be things that come against you that's going to make you not want to rejoice. But guess what you got to do? You got to rejoice again. So that means you want to do it over and over. It's a constant renewing of the mind. So therefore, I'm going to have to remind myself that I have joy, that I have peace, that I have an answer. Because I can look to the man who created the heavens and the earth and can do all things. He holds the world in the palm of his hand. And it's always, it says he knows the beginning and the end because he's so big. He can see both at the same time. And he has ordered your footsteps to whatever you say, whatever you do, he's going to lay it out in front of you. And your choice is just to make up your mind. So guess what? This morning, let's make up our mind that we're going to choose the right path. And that's the path that says we can do all things in Christ Jesus that strengthen me, that the world's going to come against me, but the world's the light because it reigns in darkness. I reign in light. Light exposes darkness. And it brings out who we are. So this close in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your love and mercy, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that I presented this in a way, Lord, that it was understood. And Lord, that it comes straight from your heart, Lord. Lord, every every video I play, Lord, I know that the devil tried to make it skip and hold up, Lord, but let us know that it was every one was ordered by you, Lord, that these were given to me by you to prove the point, Lord, of what this message was about, Lord. That we can live in our imagination, Lord. That you said the only way to impress you and to, 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 to please you is to live in faith. It says it's impossible to please you without faith. So, Lord, let us pull more on faith. But, Lord, most of all, in a situation, Lord, let us stop, be slow to speech, slow to anger, and always seek what you would have us do, Lord. And let what we do, it would always be the mindset that always lifts you up and gives you the glory for everything we do. And as we go home, Lord, I pray for each and every one, Lord. I thank you for, for who they are and what they've done, Lord, and what they're about to do, Lord. And, Lord, I see in the, in the midst of this, this thing, Lord, I see great, mighty men and women of God doing mighty things in the kingdom to win the lost, Lord. We say we love you with our heart, mind, body, and soul. Amen.